an American conversation. To all of you inbred hillbilly gas guzzlers who live in between the coasts, starved of culture and education, poisoned by Jesus and fornicating in trailers, why don't you set down your little guns, crack open a book, use some birth control, try a vegetable once in a while, get yourself a passport and shut your fucking mouth. <laughs> To all you greedy, soulless city folk who think you know what's right for everybody, climbing into a stinky train every day with a bunch of total strangers, spending your life savings to pay rent on a shoebox, waiting in line 45 minutes for overthought artisanal pizza, and saying things like, I feel so much better once I gave up sugar. Why don't you shut the fuck up? Sorry, I just had to get off off my chest. That's not really what I was going to read. <laughs> An hour after my last college final, I got a job. I had no burning desire to purchase, pursue a career in local television, but there I was, shaking hands and becoming an employee before the diploma was even in my possession. This was President Reagan's trickle-down in action. We had entrusted the president with, in his words, the stewardship of our dreams. And apparently, I would be cashing some checks. I joined a crew of other young people in the production department of a TV station, helping serve up the typical mix of newscasts and talk shows for viewers of Eugene, Oregon. We adjusted lights and operated cameras, and because I had a sliver of radio experience, I was also enlisted to do some voiceover work. A slide of the cast of MASH would appear on the screen, accompanied by my peppy tagline. Hawkeye adopts a horse for the 4077 7th with hilarious results. Tomorrow night at 7 on KVAO TV, Eugene. <laughs> Once a week, the S SPCA would bring in dogs to be adopted, and we would film the pet of the day segments, each animal looking into the camera, hoping for a better life outside the cage. Sometimes a dog would get spooked by the equipment, but there was never time to calm it down and reshoot. So viewers would see a terrified Cocker Spaniel cowering behind a pair of legs as a cheery voice, voice intoned, This little guy's name is Rusty. He's two years old and he loves children. <laughs> the crew would joke amongst ourselves, Well, Rusty's going to get gassed. <laughs> my, my parents were ecstatic that I was employed. I was miserable. Is this it? Is this where I end up? Fat and divorced, filming pets, and treating southwestern Oregon to phrases like, the quest of ambition, the passion of dreams, can be yours each week on Falcon Crest. <laughs> I thought I wanted to be a writer. I read lots of books, or at least I own lots of books. I took creative writing classes, I kept a box full of journals, but I needed more input, some influence from a grander source that would help me make something of myself. The flyers were all over Eugene. Ken Kesey was to give a one-day writer's workshop. Kesey was the hometown hero. He grew up across the river in Springfield and, like me, had graduated from the University of Oregon. My friends and I were big fans of Tom Wolfe's Electric Kool-Aid book and the hippie bus adventures. But before his LSD clown career came two brilliant novels. The classic One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, published when he was only 27, a New York Times bestseller written from the perspective of an American Indian mental patient. In 1964, he followed that with Sometimes a Great Notion, yeah! another daring work which incorporated multiple points of view, sometimes within the same sentence. Two groundbreaking books crackling with energy birthed in a strange little bubble of history after the beats and before the hippies, mirroring a nation on the cusp of mass confusion. The film version of Cuckoo's Nest was pretty compelling, especially for a kid in junior high. But I later discovered the novels and realized Kesey's characters epitomized the West. Loggers, Indians, land developers, village drunks and crazies. I was from this part of the country. I could identify with all of it. By this time, I'd read some East Coast writers like Plimpton, Salinger, Updike, 
They were really smart, but their books seemed like dispatches from foreign lands. Too neurotic, too much hand-wringing. That wasn't the America I knew. Kesey hadn't written any fiction in nearly 20 years, but still, this was my first opportunity to hear an actual writer from my side of the Mississippi. I walked into the classroom and immediately knew I'd made a mistake. <laughs> the seats were filled with deadheads, sporting their Guatemalan yarn hats and little satchels decorated with beadwork. A few were reminiscing about a recent appearance by Kesey and Jerry Garcia on the Tomorrow Show program with Tom Snyder, and how hilarious it was because the two were obviously totally stoned. I had nothing against deadheads. You couldn't. In Eugene, they were inescapable. Even U of O professors wore the t-shirts. You'd go to a house party, and the never-ending dead soundtrack was always on the stereo, with somebody saying, yeah, this is a soundtrack from Sweden, 72. They played for like four hours before the show even started. I liked some of the music and respected that they carved out their own niche, but I always wondered how a band could have two drummers and still sound so sloppy. And I really had nothing against acid at the time. I once went to the Oregon coast with a few friends, tripping heavily, and we discovered an injured seagull sitting in the sand. We all crept up, wondering how we could save this poor animal, this innocent creature of God. Maybe its wing was broken. Maybe another animal had attacked it, and it was mortally wounded, waiting to die. We knelt down to inspect, and the gull looked at us, and stood up, and flew away, and blew all of our minds. <laughs> <laughs> LSD was said to open doors, heighten perception, strip away the ego, and tune you into the infinite oneness. My big acid revelation? Birds are not always injured. <laughs> Kesey strolled into the room late, smiling and wearing a dirty serape, sipping a smoothie through a straw. The organizers had collected stories from students, and he read through a few of them, making a few general comments, very simple suggestions. It reminded me of an article I once read about John Lennon in the recording studio. He never tweaked a lot of knobs. He would always make one simple adjustment. The similarity became made even more sense when I realized these were two guys who had both done a lot of drugs. <laughs> Kesey cracked a lot of jokes which the saucer-eyed deadheads devoured, snickering as though the whole experience was some sort of secret satirical joyride. Nobody had any questions or comments, but the connection was amazing to witness. The room was hyper-focused into Kesey's every mannerism, every aside. Even a pause to sip the smoothie would elicit a ripple of chuckles. To my earnest little mind, it had fuck all to do about writing. I slunk out of the workshop in disgust. Maybe I should have gotten high, but then I might not have remembered anything at all. I didn't know what I wanted. And I don't blame Kesey for coasting on a success. Best-selling books, a Broadway play, a film that swept the Oscars, those are hard acts to follow. Kicking back and making deadheads giggle would be a lot easier than sitting in a room by yourself writing books. But I'm sorry. This was 1983. Elvis Costello had released eight albums by this time. <laughs> Most of the room was my age. What was up with all the hippie shit? <laughs> Having learned nothing other than the John Lennon similarity, I continued my pathetic non-career for several more months, working at the TV station, sleeping with a few of the female staff along the way. I performed sketch comedy in biker bars. I scribbled in more journals, wrote a couple of astoundingly bad one-act plays. And suddenly, as it often occurs to the young and the frustrated, I realized I could just leave. I gave up my studio apartment, which overlooked a dumpster behind a KFC, and packed everything I owned into a car. My last night in Oregon, the production crew of the station threw me a going-away party. The sun came up, and then I said goodbye and drove to San Francisco and got a job washing dishes. In a way, I never would have done it 
without Ken Kesey. So wherever you are, sipping a smoothie and the great psychedelic beyond, thanks for the nudge.